you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it, but you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buff here. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is real estate investment experts, Veena Jetty and Sapan Talati. Veena and Sapan are the founding partners at Enzo Multifamily. The two of them have more than 10 plus years of real estate experience, including overseeing management of 1 billion plus in real estate assets. In 2017, Enzo Multifamily acquired more than $100 million in multifamily assets and they're growing ever since then. So they've got a lot going on over there at Enzo. So I'll tell you guys, that I'm, I'm very excited to get onto the show with Veena and Sapan. But before we do, here's a quick word from our show sponsor, Sunrise Capital Investors. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with Sunrise Capital Investors. As you are hopefully already well aware, if you've been a listener for any period of time, my goal has always been to provide you with as much value as I possibly can through my two podcasts, Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow and the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. As our audience continues to grow, literally, we've been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 125 countries. I've had thousands of people reach out looking to get involved in our niche. And that's the phenomenal niche of mobile home park investing. For those that don't know, I've been a full-time real estate investor for nearly 20 years now, and I've personally invested in and have owned apartment complexes, various commercial properties, hundreds of single family rentals, and I've interviewed some of the most successful investors in just about every other asset class. And I've arrived at this one very simple conclusion. Mobile home parks are hands down the best investment I've found to date. Why? They provide investors with the best risk-adjusted returns out of any other real estate sector that I've seen. Investing in real estate can get complicated, and I really want to simplify this process for you. If you're someone who wants to diversify away from the uncertainty of Wall Street and allocate a percentage of, of your real estate portfolio to mobile home parks, but maybe you don't have the time nor the inclination to personally locate good deals yourself, then our team will do it for you. At Sunrise Capital Investors, our team specializes in the acquisitions and management of undervalued and highly profitable mobile home parks. And we are now providing accredited investors with an opportunity to participate directly alongside our team in our up and coming deals. And let me say this, I believe that we are hands down the best in our space at sourcing highly profitable off-market deals. That's really what makes us unique in this niche and as investment managers. As stewards of your capital, we truly are aligned with our investors. We've structured our investment fund so that we as a company are incentivized in the same way the investor is, which is through the performance of the investment itself. In addition, we want to make sure that we not only make money for our investors, but that they understand how it's being made. That's why we provide our accredited partners with a private monthly podcast that walks them through the detailed updates on how their investment is performing. And we're very transparent, providing with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times. And so if you'd like to learn more about the partnership opportunities with our team here at Sunrise, please go visit sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and click on the investors link to get signed up. It's absolutely free and you'll get placed on the priority list of when new opportunities come along. Also, feel free to call us at 833-CASHFLOW without the O. Again, that's 833-CASHFLOW without the O. And one of our investor relations team members will help you schedule an appointment to speak with one of our managing principals. If you have questions, go ahead and schedule a call and let's get on the phone and talk. And with that, guys, I'd like to leave with one last thought. From the time that I wake up in the morning to the time that I lay my head down the rest of the evening, my number one priority with everything I do, whether it be recording this podcast, working for our investors, helping each of you reach your investment goals, to providing a great experience to each of our residents who reside in our communities, is to add huge amounts of value to everyone that I come in contact with. Now, with that being said, I look forward to the opportunity of bringing value to you through Sunrise and through this podcast. Thank you for your time. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the show. All right. So now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Veena and Sapan to the show. Guys, how are you doing today? We're good. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. 
Yeah. Doing well. Thanks, Kevin. I'm excited to have you guys here. And so just to give our listeners a sense of geography, where are each one of you calling in from today? Because I know you're not in one location. So where are you guys based out of today? Yeah. So I'm calling in from the northern Dallas suburb of Frisco, Texas. And I'm calling in from Orange County, Southern California. Okay. Well, fantastic. Good deal to guys. Well, looking forward to dissecting your business model today. You guys have had a lot of activity happening there at Enzo. I mean, $100 million of acquisitions in in one year alone is quite exciting. And I'm sure that 2018 is also probably on a good outlook for you guys as well. So that that was some really good numbers down 17. I'm excited to find out what you guys got going on today. But maybe what we can do by starting things off here, each one of you, maybe Vina, you start first and foremost, and give our listeners a little bit more of a background of yourself and then you know how you got into multifamily. Give us a little bit of the story behind it, if you would. So I actually come from a heavy real estate family. My parents came here from India about 35 years ago or so and started investing into single family homes. That was kind of their bread and butter. That was back when they were giving you like 110% loans because you needed like your rehab budget. So they had it a lot easier than single family (laughs) investors do today. And so I grew up around this, you know, when I was like a kid, I remember going to closings and house walks and rehabs and meeting contractors. And I just thought everybody did that. I didn't know that this wasn't normal. So I think that's probably what kind of started building this foundation for me. You know, went to college, you know, had fun for four years, got out of college, joined the family company, and then went into corporate America. My most recent position in corporate America was at Tishman Spire, where I had a billion dollar asset was kind of my my baby, so to speak. I ended up leaving there because I realized that I was doing something that I could be doing for myself. And, you know, I they say like entrepreneurs will work a hundred hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week for somebody else. Right. That was me. <laughs> so I left there. St- my husband and I started our own company. And I, I say that just to give him some credit, but it was totally all me. <laughs> he has a completely independent career. And so I started buying turnkey properties, kind of graduated from turnkey single family into light rehab. And then it just kept kind of snowballing from there, got to a point where it's not really that scalable. It's very tough to do 150 units at a time when you're doing single family homes. Knew that multifamily was the next thing that we needed to be in. We met, Sapin and I met sometime around then, and we both (laughs) kind of like reached that ceiling, so to speak, and decided to kind of join forces and do something bigger together and that was kind of the start of Enzo Multifamily. Okay. When, when did you actually make your, your entrance into buying those, those turnkey properties? I mean, give me like a year wise. 2012 was my first. Yeah, 2012 was my first. And then I want to say like 2015 was probably my busiest year. Got it. Got it. So, but now okay. I'm out of the single family game. I have a few. 100% that, gone. Yeah. Well, All not right. 100%. I have a okay. few that I just have, but I try not to do anything in single family anymore. Fantastic. And so are you out of the corporate world now as well? Mm-hmm. Are you are you focused 100% on your multifamily business? Yeah. Got it. Got it. Good deal. Sapan, how about yourself, bud? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I've a uh, very similar path as Vina. I actually came from a management consulting background, focusing on strategies and operations. A lot of my engagement while we're on operational side inv- involved real estate as a whole. So those engagements might include on the commercial side, locating office locations based on traffic count, just based on the products that my clients were selling. Is this the right demographic? And then involved on international development opportunities as well with the same Fortune 500 clients in India and other countries. Really got a better understanding when I started working for some of the housing departments, uh, larger cities across the country, working on their loan portfolios as it related to multifamily housing, mostly for affordable housing. From there, I had a, a pretty good grasp on both sides of the house as well as underwriting where I was like, you know, this seems pretty easy. I'm going to dabble into it myself, partnered up with some folks. Uh, We bought some single family homes together to a point where then I started buying my own, my own portfolio. My property management company had approached me saying, we've got a lot of turnkey homes available where you can invest into it. And this is around when no one wanted to touch that, 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. Eventually that started drying up and I started looking for more better opportunity, higher yield, less competition versus let me figure out a way to leverage this any better. Vina and I met sometime soon after that, where it just made a lot more sense of let's look at multifamily. There's significant opportunity here. And now we're kind of reach, reaching a point where we're looking for other areas within multifamily where we can work with less competition and really 
proliferate with our business model, which I'm sure we'll get into a bit more here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I appreciate that guy. So let's talk about that, that turning point into multifamily. And obviously both of you guys took similar paths to get there with the single family road, but talk to me about that first entry point into multifamily. Maybe you guys were, were together at that point. I'm not sure if you were partners at that point in time, but generally speaking, what did that look like? What did that first property look like? But I think more importantly, before you answer that question, why multifamily? I mean, there, there's, I know, I understand the scalability side of it. Single family is just inc- it's incredibly difficult to scale. I know personally, I had a very large single family portfolio back prior to 2008 and it took many years to build it. And I, I wasn't a smart investor then because I could have put the same energy and probably had 12,000 doors, uh, you know, from mm-hmm. the same amount of effort that it took me to build a, you know, multi hundred unit single family home portfolio. In any event, we all live and learn, right? Yeah. <laughs> all, all our, our past yeah. mistakes. And here we are today. But tell me what the uh, why multifamily. I could sum that up in three words and then we can expand on that. Sure. But I, I would say risk adjusted return. And then from there, everything else kind of falls in place. Uh, so it's not necessarily going to be the highest return on your dollar per se. Mm-hmm. But we've always viewed the data to show that it's the best return relative to the risk that you take on. And then tie that into more or less where Vina and I and you know other folks at the Enzo multifamily team are looking for in terms of where we want to be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from today. So it's not so much of just living in the present and, and building this massive portfolio, but also the scenarios and the strategy behind where we want to be career-wise or even individually and then family-wise. And so we feel like this is one of the best ways to create a low risk, high yield opportunity from a passive standpoint at some point and offer other opportunities for us. I'll let Vina answer a bit more about why multifamily from, from the detail side of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you, can, you actually summed it up really well. You know, it's about the lifestyle. Like you said, Kevin, you know how tough it is to build a portfolio that, I mean, and I keep coming back to scalability, but that really is it at the end of the day. The risk is much lower as far as like for my personal portfolio, it's much lower risk for me to be invested in multifamily than it is single family. You have one vacancy on a single family home and you're all all of a sudden at a hundred percent vacancy. Whereas if you have a 150 unit property, well, who cares if you have one vacancy? It's okay. You actually kind of want that, right? So you should have that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You want that. You don't want to be at a hundred percent occupancy. So it's just a totally different model. I also really hate managing tenants. Like I hate it. I hate it so much. So we don't do anything where we can't have third party management that are professional managers that do this for a living. And, you know, and that's what I always tell people when they ask me like, oh, okay, I want to get started with single family. Do you have any advice for me? Yeah, don't do it. (laughs) Go straight to multifamily. If I knew then what I know today, I would have never bought a single family rental. Yeah. No, no. That, those, are, those are both great answers and great reasons why <laughs> that's why we're focused. Not necessarily in your space. Mm-hmm. We're in manufactured housing, which is still a very similar demographic. Great space. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So did you guys, were you guys teamed up when you bought this first multifamily property together? Did you guys kind of buy, you know, someone your own and then realize that your efforts were better put forth together or how'd that work out? Yeah. So we, we were teamed up when we did our first okay. together. I think we've both been involved in larger asset classes and yep. commercial assets prior, but that was through corporate America. This was kind of the first time we stepped into multifamily was together. We also have two other partners as well today, Neil Dandona and Pooja Talati. And both of them have been great assets for us. And it just makes it so much easier when you have a great team to kind of scale the business. Talk to me about that team a little bit. You guys had a lot of activity in 2017. And what does that look like for 2018, uh, 2018 now? Like, what, what are you guys expecting to hit as far as additional doors added to your portfolio? Do you have a general idea what that's going to look like? Seven, do you know what our total doors is going to be this year? Because <laughs> sure. I don't think I... So, I mean, I think, well, we're still yeah. in acquisition mode this year. We've got a, a couple okay. more in our contract that we're looking to close, but we're just shy of 2,000 total portfolio. Okay. Fantastic. Give me an idea of the, the four team members, the four partners in your firm, the idea of the roles and responsibilities associated with each each one of those individual team members, if you wouldn't mind that. Yeah. So we have, there's only four of us that are partners. Okay. So we wear a lot of hats. Sapin is the one who is, you know, kind of a genius with numbers. And Sapin, don't let this go to your head because I know it well. But no, he's the one that does our underwriting, our financial analysis, our debt structuring, our PE structuring. He's the one that kind of handles all that financial side. 
you know, I always tease him because he loves a good spreadsheet. So that we let him do that. I've got, I've got one of those partners too. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have those partners when you're not the partner that likes yeah. those things. So yeah. you need one of those. So that's kind of his role within the company. I, there's a lot of other hats that he wears, but that is one of the big things, at least for me, that's like a value add to the mm-hmm. team. We have Pooja Talati, who actually happens to be his sister. So we know him. We know her really well. Uh, we have someone vouching for her. And she comes from a corporate background. So her previous role was within the Hershey company. Mm-hmm. And she does all of our brand strategy, all of our marketing, everything we put out that looks pretty. It's all her. And she does a really fantastic job with you know, our newsletters and our social media. And she handles all of that. She also dips her toe in the investor relations water. And she kind of handles some of our CRM processes. I primarily handle the CRM investor relations alongside our other partner, Neil Dandona. Neil and Sepin have actually been working very closely together doing um, operations. So once the asset is operating, they do a lot of the analysis on you know the ROI and what whether we should put carpet in or wood flooring or do we need to add washers and dryers, valet trap. Those are decisions that they really kind of take. Did I, Sepin, did I sum up everybody's kind of role pretty? I, I would say it's a very... <laughs> <laughs> Very good stuff. <laughs> How about yourself, Vina? You didn't sum up your own role. Oh, I, I'm assuming oh. you're, you're probably on the you're on the front line. You're on the acquisition <laughs> side. I'm guessing. I am. Yes, I'm on the acquisition side. I handle a lot of external relationships for the company. So whether that be brokers, vendors, property management, investors. I, you know, I'm a, I'm the people person. I'm the heavy extrovert of the group. So I do everything external to Enzo. Got it. I mean, that's a lot of load on each one of you. I mean, especially you, Vina. Yeah. I, I know at the investor relations side, how much <laughs> effort and energy that takes mm-hmm. as I do the acquisition side. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they really are two full-time jobs. I mean, they yeah. can be. It depends if you're in capital raising mode or not, but I can tell you, I don't handle that side of the business in our company, but we just went okay. through a big raise recently and it literally consumes for a month and a half mm-hmm. or two months, consumes my partner as he goes out there raising, you know, 10, 15 million dollars. I mean, it's it's a big process and a lot of effort and legwork Mm -hmm. involved there. And and that doesn't even count the actual time, you know, fostering those relationships as, you know, once you've already created Mm -hmm. them. So kudos to all you guys for for finding each other and finding those complementary skill sets. I mean, I think that's vitally important when someone's looking Mm -hmm. for a partnership that's going to bring value as a team collectively, right? I mean, you guys have figured that out. So kudos to, to you for doing that. I want to understand your business model now. I want to get a better sense of, it's what we know multifamily, right? But what does that mean? I mean, give me some of the underlying fundamentals you guys are looking for, as well as the general markets that you guys are seeking investments in, or maybe that you currently own today. We're in Dallas right now. We're in Florida, like central markets, Jacksonville. We love uh, Orlando. Uh, near you, we like Tampa. And those are markets we're focusing on. There are other good markets out there that we've looked at, evaluated. But from a team standpoint, because we consider this whole thing as a team, so that includes the property management company, the brokers and the relationships, we're seeing a lot of good deal flow from those particular markets and submarkets that we like. The other part to that is we want to be in areas that we see we can ride through the recession where we feel confident, where it may not be necessarily a strong yield play or strong value add, but maybe a tax shelter play for certain opportunities. Yeah. So. We look at our whole portfolio as a whole and diversify across that. So our model isn't predicated on we're going to do just value add only or just yield play, or it's not just as long as it's a three-year or five-year hold, we're seeing seven-year hold. So we want to we want to be diversified across that as well. Mm-hmm. And we're planning for, along with the right debt structure, where we can ride out something, whether it's 2020, 2021, whatever, we don't have that crystal ball, but yeah. to be a, in a conservative manner. And we, we might be changing our goal specifically over the next five, seven year time horizon versus what we were seeing 2015, 16, 17, where it's easy to just double your money and be out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then as far as like the general size that you guys are looking for, uh, give me the idea of uh, the size units or the size complexes sure. you guys are seeking. And then are these, uh, you know, stabilized B, you know, stabilized C. I know some value add you do as well. I mean, right. again, as you just mentioned, you like a diverse portfolio. So give mm-hmm. us a much more detailed sense of what it is you guys are buying. Sure. So we pride ourselves on B and C, but what we've really been looking at has been more more or less Bs and strong Bs overall. We're seeing opportunity. And like I was saying, Florida has been a boon for us. Um, we still think there's a lot of runway, so to speak, remaining in some of those submarkets over there. We're not seeing as many having that value add component as we are in the Dallas Metro uh, Fort Worth area. We're seeing less competition over there. And then kind of in that 40 to 60 million, maybe even as high as 80 million range, there's just significantly less competition as a whole. Uh, it's too small for insurance companies, a little bit too large for most syndicators that are recently coming into this market. 
So the walls are a little bit higher, allows us to really play a little bit more freely. And at the same time, you know, that doesn't mean we won't take on something smaller. I and mean, we just purchased something around 15 and a half million over in Jacksonville. It was just a nice, solid entry point. There's no A-class nearby. So we didn't yeah. see any competition, you know, as far as like the turns go, at least up. So we look at other metrics as well. Does it concern you in Florida? I mean, I live in Florida, so sure. and I'm, I'm right near the coast. But uh, do, do hurricanes concern you? I know that scares some people away. You know, the weather patterns. I know that every area pretty much has, has their own natural disasters that can occur. But th- does that concern you whatsoever as far as buying near a coast? Not entirely. I, I think if we look at the data going back the last 15, 20 yeah. years, just looking at that alone, I think as, if someone's able to interpret that, you'd see that it really isn't as large of a, a concern. The other part of that is just got to you know, put that into your underwriting, make sure you've got reserves for that and see if the yeah. numbers still work. And then it's right, the right type of insurance, uh, you know, being to collaborate on that further if, if, if that's something of interest, you know, to investors. Let's talk about the syndicated model itself. I mean, I'm a big fan when someone talks to me about syndication, you know, whether they have some experience being an investor or not, either way. But if they're talking about going out and starting to raise capital and they haven't done that before, I always tell them that if you haven't actually proven the concept of whatever it is, whether you're going to syndicate multifamily, mobile home parks, office buildings, whatever it might be, whatever asset class you choose, I always suggest that it's a good idea for them to try to prove their concept, whatever it is they're going to be taking to the market and, and raising capital for, prove it themselves with, with their own capital at risk, first and foremost. That's not necessarily the only way to do it, but that's just the suggestion I give to those that, that you know don't really have that much of a track record. But you guys had a track record coming into this. You both had owned a, a lot of real estate, had a lot of experience behind that as well. Give me an idea of that first property. I mean, did you guys dive into it with your own capital or did you syndicate right out of the gate? We syndicated right out of the gate. Good for you. Our motto is go big or go home. So we just went big. I don't think that's your motto. I think you just borrowed that from somebody. No, I totally made it up on the spot right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but it's something we kind of adhere to in everything that we do. And yeah, I, I mean, it's always easier to use other people's money to buy things, right? Like... I didn't know. So when I first started in real estate, my parents kept talking about like OPM. I didn't know that they meant like literally other people's money and not like bank loan. So, well, now obviously I know that's totally not what they meant. But I think like syndicating was actually kind of a perfect fit for our group. Like you said, we had a track record coming in. We already had the experience resume. If someone's starting out, what I always tell them is find a partner (coughs) who can lend you a resume, right? So. If you have a partner that has a strong track record or that can kind of act as a someone that can you can bounce ideas off of or a mentor or a partner or JV or however you do it, I think that's a really great start mm-hmm. because it kind of, I mean, execution risk is the biggest risk that investors perceive, right? They they understand real estate generally. They'll know if they like the asset or not. The question is, is Is the business plan underwritten well? Is it planned for well? Does it make sense? And can you actually execute on it? So that's what I always tell investors when they're starting out. If they want to syndicate their own deal, find an experienced partner. If you don't have the resume, if you have the resume and you have the network, I mean, just do it. Yeah, yeah, right. right. (laughs) Like, just do it. What do you think the most important there's multiple different pieces of the puzzle of being a good syndicator. Give me, if, if you just had to pick the most important one, I know I know what I would say. I know my opinion on that on that question. But what do you think the one most important thing for new syndicators that are looking to get into this space uh, and start raising capital from outside folks? I mean, is it is it finding that? And maybe just gave us the answer. Is it finding that that person with the track record if you don't have it yourself? Or is it being able to find deals? I mean, I, me personally, I say deals because nothing yeah. else happens unless you yeah. know how to underwrite and how to identify Absolutely. a good option. Opportunity. It doesn't matter if you have money. It doesn't know if you know good sponsors that can come in and, and help you, uh, you know, Absolutely. take on that deal. So, would yeah, you agree I, totally, with that? I totally agree with that. So, that's what I always tell people is we never go into anything wondering how we're going to pay for it, right? Yeah. We buy first and worry how to pay for it later. It. So, you know, because, because what we always say is we say no to good deals, we say yes to great deals. And when we say yes to great deals, the money follows. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's money everywhere. Capital is never a problem for us. We're luckily also at a point now where we are overfunding every single one of our deals. So we're turning investors away right now. We have waiting lists on our deals. I mean, I'm sure you know, you guys are probably... It's a good problem to have, right? Yeah, it's a great problem. It's painful to have it it because you don't want to give back that money. But you know, you have to... If you produce great deals... Yeah. The money follows. So I agree with you. I don't think it's finding the right partner. It's finding the great deal. Because if you find the great deal, 
well, guess what? There are experienced partners that will know that and they are going to be willing to partner with you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. No, that's, that's a great answer. And I agree wholeheartedly. So I want to <laughs> ask both of you guys, I want to get some feedback from you on, mm. it's really a two-part question. The first part of it is, what excites you? Generally speaking, broad brush stroke across you know, the different markets that you guys are in, but what excites you about the multifamily space today? And then on the flip side of that, what scares you? What keeps you up at night? That is a good question. Um, so what excites me personally, mm-hmm. for me, it's a lifestyle. And you know, like I said, I, entrepreneurs will work 100 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else. But really what we're doing is we're building something all four of us are very family oriented. And I think all four of us do this for our families. Like this is creating something that is not only a legacy, but it's a lifestyle. It's a, like down the road, when we retire, we're collecting mailbox money. We're not, you know, actively going to work. We, you know, our money comes in, whether we're at home in front of a computer or, you know, in Fiji on a beach somewhere. So for me, that's what excites me about multifamily in general and why we do it. Okay. What scares me... Everything scares an, or an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> like, everything scares. For me, the most important thing that I try to protect with like everything I can, no matter what, is our relationships with investors. Yeah. You know, we have had our fair share of ups and downs. I mean, before we were in multifamily, Seven and I had a project we were working on. We dealt with shady contractors. And, you know, we've always put the investors first. We've always taken care of them, made sure to communicate with them. In that situation, we actually ended up cutting our profits to make sure our, our investors were made yeah. whole and returned what we promised them. So, and I say promise, but I don't mean promised, what we show them on a pro forma. Yeah. <laughs> and what so, you projected, uh, yes. What we projected, not promised. Yeah. And so, but you know, for us, like that relationship is very important to us. Yes. The investors we have are like family to us now. You know, we say like, hey, you're part of the Enzo family now. And it's very much a culture that we want to keep and maintain. And I think for me, it's all about investors at the end of the day. And that's the only thing that would probably like really keep me up at night. But not <laughs> no, that- I, I think that's a great answer. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, your investors, I mean, they're your partners in this. You guys yep. wouldn't be here. Oh, well, yep. you would physically be here in your being, but you wouldn't be where you are in your business yep. today. Right without those partnerships right? I mean, we, we, and we feel the same way. So mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's a great answer. Sapan, how about yourself? What, um, what, you what know, excites me, you and then what scares you about the state of multifamily today? Sure. And it's very similar to Vina's. It's that lifestyle. I mean, I come yeah. from a consulting background. I used to travel for, for a living and I do the same now, but I do it for myself and yeah. I have a lot more flexibility. And, and so that's what excites me. It's the art of the deal, you know, like yep. figuring out, is this the right debt play versus that one? You know, who do we want to work with? You know, we're very loyal with who we work with. And in that regard, sometimes you want to work with certain individuals, but it may not make the best business sense. So it's, it's just navigating around that. And then scaring me is the same thing as what Mina, you know, echoed. It's really, we want to do right by our investors. And, and that's, that's our, our top priority. It's not so much the deal itself. If, if a deal looks good with the numbers, but doesn't really hit our database uh, of investors, so to speak, we'll walk away from it because we want to make sure they're comfortable with the deal because they're investing in us and they're entrusting us with their funds. So that matters far more than, you know, Hey, this is a great opportunity. Let's convince you how to make, you know, yeah. how to, how to make this work, you know? So that, that, that's really what doesn't have to keep me up at night, but yeah, <laughs> yeah I, get I get fair enough. Fair enough. You know, there's something I wanted to ask you guys about your syndicated model. How do you guys make money? I, I think that's a question that I listen to a lot of podcasts. I've had a lot of syndicators on the show and I, I forget to ask it quite often. I just assume yeah. that people know how, how the actual sponsors make money on these deals, putting these mm-hmm. deals together. And so if you wouldn't mind, and you don't have to take it from a complete granular nature, but just give sure. us an idea of where the different profit centers are and, and mm-hmm. generally speaking, how you guys structure your deals. I mean, you get a color to it, but really a lot of it's on the promote for us. We try to make it, we're incentivized to perform. Okay. Um, and a lot of that's on the back end. So sure, there may be an asset management fee uh, like we do on all of our deals, but those fees amount to, you know, may, maybe like 20, 30, 40,000 or something like that on an annualized basis. And if you factor that across the operations, cost of operations and partners, as you can tell, you know, there isn't really much there. For us, it's always been, we want to be able to perform. You know, there's a, a lot more to be said or had on the back end. And we've been performing higher than our performance so far across all of our, our entire portfolio. And so we pride ourselves on that. And I know, mm-hmm. Vina, you have a lot of discussions with investors, uh, you know, on that. So you probably can add more color to that. And, and one other question, is there, is there also an acquisition fee as well? I yes. mean, asset management fee, acquisition fee. Correct, yeah. And then uh, you guys only participate in the promote side as far as once you have met a pref, mm-hmm. Correct. 
Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. Again, I, I know that you got a couple different, I don't think you have a fund structure. So you guys are doing deal specific syndications, I assume. Is that a yeah. correct statement? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, correct. Is it six percent pref, seven percent pref on on average? I mean, is that kind of the ballpark range? Six to eight percent yeah, kind of depends okay. on the asset. Obviously, mm-hmm. it'll depend on the market. We're still seeing some deals with eight. Mm-hmm. Some of them will have six. We we really structure each deal individually. Yeah, so there's never going to be one structure we follow for every. Yeah, asset. got it. And then like a seventy thirty or eighty twenty GPLP oh. split on the backside. Mm-hmm. Yep. Correct. Got it. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. Good deal. I always like to know the different structures out there. You know, sure. it seems like every scenario is a little different. Every deal is different, right? Every. Yeah. Every deal is different. Our, our structure is a little different. We do a fund structure. So we buy multiple okay. properties mm-hmm. underneath one umbrella versus deal specific. Mm-hmm. Primarily the reason is we do a probably a higher volume of actual transaction, but our transaction size is typically wow. smaller than that of a multifamily property. Mm-hmm. A hundred, hundred unit mobile home park, right. it's going to be a three to $4 million play. Whereas in your space, it's going to be probably eight to $10 million yeah, sure. you know, uh, acquisition. So mm-hmm. um, in any event, I want to talk a little bit uh, to you guys about, you talked to me about, you, you want to buy with the idea that you can weather the storm. You don't want to be mm-hmm. necessarily, you don't want to buy thinking that you're going to be forced to you know, exit out of these or you know, feel the need to exit out of these in three to five years, right? You want to mm-hmm. buy, buy properties that can weather the storms and the downturns. But ultimately, you know, what is the end goal? You guys, I think you would thrown out a number like 10,000 doors or 20,000. You threw out a number earlier in the show uh, of kind of what the, maybe it's not the end to end goal, but it's, mm-hmm. it's one of the big lofty goals that you guys have as far as the organization is concerned. But right. paint the long picture for me of where you guys are going. I mean, is it like a acquire 10,000 doors, sell off as a portfolio to a, you know, PE firm or, you know, institutional player, or is it just build these assets for long term and hold them for as long as we want to hold them? <laughs> sure. I think for individually for all of us, that, that's a little bit different. I think collectively, we'd all like to just own this, own these outright ourselves and kind of envision retirement down that path. Mm-hmm. But really, I think, you know, one of the things we really want to do is create a lasting legacy for our kids. And I think we share that collectively as a team. But on the individual standpoint, we may want 10,000, someone may want 15,000. But as we get to that level, I think our collective involvement on the details and day-to-day and the weeds would start to be removed as we start bringing on other key partners or, mm-hmm. or just folks who can handle some of, the, some of that workload where now it becomes kind of a, a company with its own legs, so to speak. And, and so if someone, one of us disappeared for a year because we wanted to go travel Europe, we can still do that without missing a beat. Got it. I've got one other layer to add to that question is, I know today you guys are outsourcing your management to third-party fee managers. Mm-hmm. Do you foresee a point in time to where there's a cost benefit <laughs> or a control benefit of bringing it in-house? And I, and I ask that question, I, I, I know what the typical answer is, and, but there's mm-hmm. Two unique scenarios that just occurred of uh, folks that I had on the show over the recent weeks. Uh-huh. One being an operator that's got about 70,000 doors, very large operator. Mm-hmm. And I made the assumption, mistakenly made the assumption that that they probably have that in-house, right? At some point, sure. you bring it back in with a, a large scale <laughs> like that, and they did not. They still actually uh-huh. outsource it to you know multiple, uh, multiple females <laughs> in the country, which surprised me. And then on the flip side of that, I had someone on the show that had a, a fairly small portfolio Mm-hmm. And I think uh, maybe about 1,500 to 2,000 doors and literally had it in-house <laughs> and had no intent of outsourcing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Intent of outsourcing it. Um, you probably get a different answer based on who you asked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, might say no. It would have been wrong when I, when I made my assumptions of others. Completely wrong. And so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, for yeah. me, it's it's not going to be yes or no. I think it's really fluid. It, it also depends because I, I, you know, used to be on the M&A side for management consulting and I'd probably look at it, well, maybe five years, 10 years from now, there may be an entirely different tech play that will create capabilities and the ability to maybe bring all this in-house, even on a, a smaller platform, so to speak, not. You know, so I, I think it really just depends on the location of your multifamily, the states that you're invested in. It depends on your, your overall model, you know, syndication model versus do you have any in-house. So I think a lot of those intangibles would really have to be considered before making that decision. The obvious answer in front of us is yes, there's synergy there. There's you know, significant cost savings more units you have in bringing it in-house. But I think it also goes to your model itself. And, you know, are you doing the Walmart model, like volume? Or are you doing smaller, but like, I don't know, maybe like a luxury model, so to speak. You got a smaller portfolio, but, you know, and so you want to outsource that and bring a different experience, so to speak. Gotcha. No, that's a great answer. I appreciate that. And 
I want to ask you guys, and I think I know the answer to this one as well. I think we kind of covered it, but what would you change going back in time? I mean, you guys both started in single family, and I think the answer is you probably would have started buying multifamily <laughs> right out of the gate. But, uh, yeah. Is there anything in addition to that answer? Is there anything else that you would have done differently now that you've been in this game for mm-hmm. a period of time? With the exception of just buying multifamily sooner, what are some of the other changes that you would have made knowing what you know today? Man, there are so many things. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it, it, it's all about not having enough time to do everything. Mm. I think I would have loved to have had a partner sooner rather than later. I mean, if we had partnered 10 years ago, who yeah. knows what we would have been doing today. So I would have loved to have a partner sooner. And what's crazy too is his sister, Pooja, our fourth partner, her and my brother-in-law went to undergrad together and they were friends in undergrad. So we were connected 10 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) And so I feel like, you know, that was, that was missed opportunity there. I think with regards to some of the softwares, we, we run so lean when you first start up, you're just running so lean. You're trying to cut out costs and you're trying to do everything yourself and keep it in house. Knowing what I know today, I think it would have saved us so much more time if we had, you know, implemented CRM software, implemented like a investor portal, if we had, you know, had someone who we could outsource our web design, our social media content, like all of that stuff would have saved us time to be able to really focus on the things that we're good at. And, you know, those are things that can be outsourced. There's certain things that we just, I can't outsource my relationships with our friends and family. Like I can't do that. So that has to be something (laughs) I continue to do. So I think I would have outsourced sooner, found partners sooner, and definitely skipped multi or single family to go straight to multifamily. So yeah, I mean, everyone starts off with like a hundred hats, right? And the whole goal by the end of it is actually to, you know, hand all but one of those hats off to other people. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What are you guys using for the investor portal? Do you mind me asking uh, which software you're using? Yeah. So actually that is a current change we're undergoing. We're looking at a couple of different options. We haven't landed on one just yet, but it is a change that is coming in the next six months or so. Again, it goes back to time, having the time to actually like put, upload all of the current data, get everybody acclimated, investor education. It's kind of a daunting task right now, but it's definitely a change that we're going to be making here. I'm assuming I- IMS, uh, Juniper Square. Yeah, Juniper yeah, Reed, yes, yes, yes. Are three big ones yeah. that we're looking at. Yeah, we did the same thing about a year ago. We went, we started off with a very, very basic portal. I mean, it was it was enough for our first fund. We're like, okay, we're going to grow this one pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. It's not going right. to... But the reason was it, we were trying to be you know, to be cost conscious. I mean, some of those those portals are expensive, incredibly expensive to purchase and manage. And, uh, but we did ultimately go with IMS and none of them are just, I just want to let you know, none of them are perfect. (laughs) <laughs> that's always the case that is yeah, always the downsides case. of uh, of each of them but you just got to pick the one that best suits mm-hmm. you know, your business and uh and, and run with it but uh, last question i had for you guys and then we're going to move into the golden golden mm-hmm. nugget segment of the show is you guys are in different locations i'm not sure where you're uh so sapon it sounds like your wife you guys are obviously together in the same location <laughs> and then you have a you have a third partner is he in a completely different location than the two of you yeah, so Neil is actually where Vina is. So they're both okay. out of Dallas, like North Dallas, uh, the okay. Frisco. It's okay. the Allen area. And cool. Uja is based out of Austin. Gotcha, gotcha. So technology-wise, how, mm-hmm. how do you guys manage your relationships as far as you know, effective communications and maintaining efficiency mm-hmm. uh, when tough decisions have to be made, when you're underwriting sure. deals? I mean, I've got an office. <clears throat> I didn't always have an office. It was, there was points in time that we were in a virtual format, but I like having an office. I like having my partners nearby, I like having our employees. Like If I've got to mm-hmm. go to our director of operations, I'd like mm-hmm. to be able to just go ask them a question. I like right. that. I know it's not necessary. I know there's plenty of people that do it in a virtual format, but I'm interested sure. to hear how you guys manage that process and how you intend to manage that as you grow your organization. Sure. And a lot of that, I think, kind of goes back to our corporate experience as we're starting to see that that shift, you know, that uh, IT digital shift where it's not uncommon. I mean, I was involved in an M&A with Wells Fargo and they had three different quote unquote headquarters uh, in different states. Mm-hmm. And so virtual meetings, very much like the ones we're having today, yeah. Are, are very common. You see each other face to face. You know, there there are times where it's nice to be able to walk down the hall and see so and so. So you know, you're going to have your your bumps uh, along the way. But I think in terms of efficiency, we we've been able to be very efficient. We each have some folks that work for us or under us that we're we're responsible for, and so that allows us to really drive. Uh, we have very frequent touch points and huddles. We use technology as a whole. We use Slack to stay in mm-hmm. touch uh, throughout the day without email overkill. 
And, and then uh, we have dashboards. So we have a lot of tools we use as well without it being overkill, but just the right amount of tools where we've got access to information. We've got a lot of VAs that help us uh, keep things up to date. So if I'm looking, for example, I don't know, maybe I have to make something as simple as a wire transfer for, for an investor and they just need some information. I could just easily find that without having to run to Vina or Puja. Like, can you send me that information? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, we actually just started using Slack in our business That's and awesome. it's a game changer. Yeah, yeah so. we love Slack. <laughs> I mean, we thought we could stay on the free model for like a year. Mm -hmm. We went through the 10,000 messages in like, Two oh, months. It's quick. So, quick. And you know what else we do actually with Slack? Um, something that we've recently started utilizing is when we bring on partners into any of our projects, like for example, our property management, we'll create a separate Slack channel for them for each asset. Okay. So if they have quick questions for us, like, hey, we need approval to start renovations on unit 703 on whatever asset, one of us can go, go in there and say, yep, absolutely go ahead. Or no, wait, we need to talk about this. Or it's just a way to keep in touch without it being as demanding as an email or text or call. Yeah. I hate emails. God, yes. I hate emails. We I can't stand them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've just given up. I throw my hands up over the past yeah. six months. If I don't make it to it in a day or two, I kind of know the priorities, but if it's like second, third priority, sometimes yeah. it just doesn't get answered. Yeah. <laughs> you know. True for all of us. <laughs> Everybody does that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, good deal. A lot. Actually, one last question about the Slack is you probably you mentioned your property management company. You guys, get, you know, open up a you know dedicated Slack channel for each one of those mm -hmm. assets. Was it hard to get them to adopt using that, or were they already using it? Internally? No, it was very easy. They're very actually tech friendly. Okay. Um, so good. one of the things when we were looking for property management companies is it's not just the number of doors they have or just their assets, but cultural fit. I think it's really important. You know, probably the same goes to like the team, the partners you have uh, beyond just skill sets. It's mm -hmm. cultural fit. Do I really want to work with this person five years, 10 years? Can I, I mean, you're gonna spend a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time, you know, walking properties together or just celebrating together. And you want to be able to have the, share those milestones in a, in a celebratory mm -hmm. way. And same we, you know, way we look at our property management team, our, our, our lenders, you know, we're very selective about that. It's not always about can this person or this, this team get us an extra five basis points off of, you know, our, our yield spread. It's more important of can they work with us in unique scenarios and can we get the deal done and close in time? And we like to close by the ninth or 10th hour, not so much in the 11th hour. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I wish every deal actually went the way it was. Well, that way. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, guys, guys, this is where we're going to roll into what I call the golden nugget segment of the show. And you guys have shared a lot of golden nuggets today. But if you if you had just one last one that you could you know pull out of this hiding spot that would offer advice and some wisdom to the listeners that are tuning in here today, um, that are looking for the inspiration, motivation to progress their real estate investing career to where you guys are at today, what would that one last golden nugget be? For me, it would be, I think what happens a lot of times when people are new into the real estate space and they don't necessarily have, you know, a corporate background or a family background, like we've been fortunate to have is they get into, you know, analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very tough to get out of for a lot of new investors. And they want to ask and plan for every single contingency. And I understand that because I'm a total planner. I want like plan A, B, C, and D. But you have to just jump in. Yeah. I, I, you know, I go back again to finding good partners, whether it's internal or external to your <clears> company. <throat> that will really be, I think, the key to your success. And you know, I don't like to think of real estate as being competitive. I like to think of it as being collaborative. There yeah. is enough to go around. Mm -hmm. And when you find great partners, whether it's JV partners or equity partners or you know, operating partners, whatever it is, nurture those relationships and focus on those and just, just do it. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. it. I love it. How about Sapan? How about your, your gold? We get two gold nuggets here. Today. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's what's motivational. Maybe. Uh, I think it's really just follow, follow your passions. You know, I yeah. think our website says it best where life is too short to work forever and life yeah. is too long to retire on a budget. That was enough for me to say, you know what? I'm very yeah. passionate about entrepreneurism. I'm going to figure out a way to make this happen and just go make it happen. Um, yeah. you know, there's no one telling you you can't. Yeah. One of our core principles here, uh, one of the five core principles is enjoy the ride. Like have fun doing what you're doing. If you're not having fun with it, go find something else. You know, go, go find out what it is that you actually enjoy that you have that passion for that you can come yeah. in day in, day out, yeah. you know, five, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. Cause sometimes that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you still walk away. Not, 
hundred percent with a smile, but ninety nine percent of the time, it <laughs> doesn't feel like work, right? Because there's some, of those, there's some of those days you're like, oh gosh, uh, yeah, you work. walk away with more gray hair yeah. and wrinkles some days, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. it's the nature of the beast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you joining us on here on the show today. You guys have had some great success. I just you keep continuing doing what you're doing because obviously, whatever you're doing is, is working. It's working really well for you. So I really appreciate you joining us here on the show. And for those that want to learn more about Venus Upon and their company, they can go visit their website, which is enzomultifamily.com. And enzo is E-N-Z-O, enzomultifamily.com. And Vina, Sapan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to keeping in touch with you guys and uh, following your progress, okay? You take Likewise. care. Likewise. Thank you. Have, have an awesome day, okay? Thanks Peace. for having us. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.